Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to the Lord's house on this Sunday morning. It's good to have you folks here in this Advent season. There are announcements that are in your bulletin. I would like to bring a couple to your attention. One is that we are having Christmas Eve down in Minneapolis this year, 5 p.m. For the last four years, basically, we've been swapping back and forth. Uh, this is the fourth year. Last year it was here. Next year, or this coming year, it's there. I really hope all of you come. Uh, it's time the last time it was down there it was great I think there was more of you than there was of them and uh, which I think is a great like I said is a great thing it's a great showing and I hope you do that again as we celebrate Christmas Eve together because we are celebrating Christmas Eve together uh, the session has decided not to have worship on the 25th Christmas Day and we will not be having worship on the 1st of January either, New Year's Day. So those of you who are staying up to see the ball and, 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 and having a party or whatever, you'll be able to sleep in. Uh, and, but we will be having worship on the 8th. Uh, stay tuned for that in terms of uh, whether there's anything special about that. Worship is at the Morning Sun Care Center this Wednesday with communion. So uh, I would encourage you to come and support the people that are there, the residents, uh, during this time, if you're able. It's at 10 a.m. And finally, uh, for those of you that are on session or are going to be on session, I would like you to come forward for a moment after church. Just for a moment uh, and I will pose a question for you to think about and no it's not related to my sermon uh, are there any other announcements that we want to make at this time Bob you're standing up I just want to point out that it's in the bulletin but on the unlimited mission of things that we want for the veterans to concentrate on the socks and stocking caps Socks and stocking packs for the veterans. Yeah, that's a size, yeah. We're kind of hoping people do it. We're still chasing that. It was pretty Okay. Any other announcements that we want to make at this time? Oh, if not, then let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we listen to Pamela play Lift Up Your Heads and then have the Advent reading. Um.
Advent points to an end to the darkness. The darkness is not yet ended, but we are given enough light to find our way. We would like to know how things will work out, but often we only know enough to choose what is right in this moment. We know God's promises assure things will be right in the end, but we don't know what troubles still remain between now and then. Revelation tells of the new Jerusalem that will come down out of heaven where there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light. That is the future we look forward to, but it is not yet. The psalmist speaks of God's word being a light, but the image is not of bright daylight showing everything near and far. One paraphrase of this passage captures more of the sense of these words. By your words, I can see where I'm going. They throw a beam of light on my dark path. As we light our Advent candles, we express our faith that God continues to throw light on our dark path. In this Advent season, we look with hope for the return of Jesus Christ in glory, but we continue to walk day by day in a world where darkness is present all around us. Let us look daily for the Spirit to guide our steps according to the Word of God, so that our light may shine before others in a world of darkness. Now please stand as you are able and join in the responsive call to worship. Our souls proclaim your greatness, O God. And our spirits rejoice in you. We will praise you as long as we live. We will sing praises to you our whole lives long. We will not trust in the powerful of this world. But will trust in you, creator of heaven and earth. The one who gives food to the hungry. The one who enacts justice for the oppressed. Our souls proclaim your greatness, O God. As we worship you in this place. Let us continue worship singing our welcoming hymn number 135. There's a song in the air.
Please be seated. Now please turn in your responsive reading books to number 59. This is Advent 3, and it is taken from Luke 2, 1 through 20. About this time, Caesar Augustus, the Roman emperor, decreed that a census should be taken throughout the nation. This census was taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Everyone was required to return to the, his ancestral home for this registration. And because Joseph was a member of the royal line, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, King David's ancient home, journeying there from the Galilean village of Nazareth. He took with him Mary, his fiancée, who was obviously pregnant by this time. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. And she gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him in a blanket and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the village inn. That night some shepherds were in the fields outside the village, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel appeared among them, and the landscape shone bright with the glory of the Lord. They were badly frightened, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you the most joyful news ever announced, and it is for everyone. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born tonight in Bethlehem. How will you recognize him? You will find a baby wrapped in a blanket, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God. Glory to God in the highest heaven, they sang, and peace on earth for all those pleasing him. When this great army of angels had returned again to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Come on, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this wonderful thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They ran to the village and found their way to Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. The shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story expressed astonishment. But Mary quietly treasured these things in her heart and often thought about them. Then and the shepherds went back again to their fields and flocks, praising God for the visit of the angels, and because they had seen the child, just as the angel had told them. We long to live as God's people, yet in the very depths of our lives, we know how we have hurt those around us through words and actions, as well as from indifference. But God hears when we call and answers with the grace we need. Let us pray together as we confess our lives to our God. God, our Father, we must confess that we have not lived as your children. We muddy the clear waters of baptism with the detritus of walking over those we claim to love. We sit in our lonely lives, feasting on bitterness, when we could be feasting with those we are told not to trust. We wait for all our desires to be taken care of by you, while you hope we would fill the lives of others with your grace and hope. Forgive us, God of this holy season, and help us to be as willing to draw near to others so we might heal their brokenness, touch their loneliness, embrace their grief, and love them as you did when you came to us so long ago, as well as in these moments. In Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Hear and live this good news. God's love has no ending. God's hope rests upon us each day. God's forgiveness restores us to new life. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Amen. 
Please be seated. As we come now to the time of hearing God's word, please join me with the, in the unison prayer for illumination. Save your God, liberate us from the sins which distort our vision and alter our hearing as we approach your word today. Let us not manipulate your word to receive the message we desire, but standing firm in your love, let us open ourselves to the truth you lay before us today. Amen. Our first reading is Romans 4, 13 to 25, and is found on page 1752 in your Pew Bibles. People have great ingenuity to make new things. Using the resources available, we create new technology, art, stories, traditions, but there are limits to what we can make. We can't make something from nothing. We can't bring life from what is dead, and we can't turn ourselves into righteous people. Only God can do all those things. Romans 4, 13 to 25. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law were heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless, because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Our second passage is from the book of Acts, chapter 2, 1 through 11, and is found on page 1692. The people in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost probably all understood Greek, at least enough to get by. The spirit-filled disciples could have been led to praise God in Greek rather than all those languages they didn't know themselves. But aside from manifesting the power of God to do what humans on their own could not, speaking in each person's native language demonstrated God's love for all these people, telling them in the words they understood at the deepest level that something very special was being made available to them. Acts 2, 1 through 11. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. 
Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, thanks to God. Aren't you glad she got the reading from Acts? We continue in our study of Romans. And I want to remind you that last week and just before that, Paul had been giving the argument that we are not justified by works, but justified by faith. And he goes into an example of Abraham and says that Abraham was not justified by his works, but by the fact that he followed God's call, having faith in God's call to go to a new land. He also noted that the circumcision that the Jews had, that they held so dear as proclaiming them the people of God, was not actually active without faith. That is, those that were circumcised in their hearts by their faith were those that were true children of God. And he then goes on now in this passage to continue with Abraham, following with another argument, which is the law. It says that he would be... Uh, the promise for, to Abraham for, and, or to his descendants that would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And he goes on to say, if it was the law, then there's no need for faith. It's amazing to me sometimes how things coordinate between Bible study and, and uh, Sunday services. And, you know, if all you needed was a checklist then all you'd have to do is do whatever was on the checklist, and once you check the list off, you're good. You can sit back, you can relax, and you can be assured that the result is what you assume it's going to be. But there is no checklist like that for those of us who are followers and children of God. And the law is actually intended to point us to our need for a Savior because it brings about God's wrath. Because where there's no law, there's no violation. In other words, if you didn't know it, how can you violate it? Now, we, we have a concept in our justice system of, of uh, ignorance before the law is no excuse. And Paul earlier in chapter 3 address that saying that everybody has a law in their hearts so even if they don't have the jewish law that they know the the ten commandments they still got the law in their heart and they're still breaking it and the law then bringing wrath pointing us to the fact that there is sin tells us of our need for a savior when we fail And, but, he says, there's grace. There's grace 
through faith, which brings faith. And we depend on God to bring us that salvation. And so he gives us another analogy, both of an example of Abraham's faith, and as I like to point out, uh, and as the liturgist pointed out obliquely, death to life. We are dead in our sins before God until he brings us to life through our faith. Regeneration by the Holy Spirit as we begin to be followers of Christ and adopted as his children. And Abraham was a sort of a living example of both death to life and what faith entailed. And it wasn't just because of his obedience in following God, where God called to the land that he saw. Abraham's promise was greater than that. It wasn't just that he was going to go to a land, take it over, and rule over it. And instead, it was about having descendants. Having a nation that was so huge that the number of people in it would be greater than the number of stars in the sky. Now Abraham, when he left on the trip, was 75 years old. That's when he left. By the time that we have this promise here, Abraham initially was 90 with his vision. And Sarah was 81. She's about nine years younger than him. And God promised a child. Now you might think, okay, great. But Abraham had to wait. Twelve years went by. And they got impatient. Sarah gave her handmaiden Hagar to Abraham in order to have a child. It was something that was done in Middle Eastern culture when there was someone who was barren. And that proved to be a mistake. And God said, look, he's not the one. I'm gonna have, you're going to have a child by Sarah. And Abraham basically said, really, how can I do that? I'm 100 years old. And Sarah's 90, and she, she's been barren all her life. As Paul says, he was as good as dead which I'm sure was a euphemism towards fertility. And, you know, we talk about sometimes with women these days having birth past the age of 40, or maybe even 50, and it's such a miracle when it occurs. It's amazing. It's also problematic for a lot of people. It's scary. Imagine if you were 90 years old and then you got pregnant. Imagine if you were 90 years old as a dad and your wife got pregnant. Can you imagine trying to go to elementary school on Parents' Day? <laughs> 12 years he waited. And then he had his son, Isaac. But you know, the promise was only fulfilled partially in Isaac, which Abraham knew. There was still the ultimate descendant, the one that was going to save the people. And Abraham waited all his life for that. And it didn't happen in his lifetime. So he had a partial fulfillment of God's direct word, you will have a child by Sarah. But he did not see the promise fulfilled of the king before he died. 
And that impinges on us in our Advent season because that king that he was waiting for, that king that he was enduring for, was Jesus Christ. It was someone who he believed in so much that even when God told him to take Isaac up to a mountaintop and sacrifice him, his only son, by Sarah, he was willing to do it. And of course we know God stopped all that and provided a ram and that's when we see the name Jehovah Jireh, God provides. But he believed beyond Isaac. He believed in the ultimate promise that God made in his covenant. Waiting, though, is hard. He at least had one miracle, if you will, that was fulfilled. One promise that he could look at every day of his life after Isaac's birth and know the goodness of God and the amazingness of God. But I sometimes wonder how he felt about not seeing the king, not seeing the lands that he had been promised completely in his grasp. Hundred and thirty, I believe he was when he died. So that was at least thirty years later. Thirty years of waiting without seeing it come to pass. And yet God, when he spoke, said in past tense, I have made you a father of many nations. pointing to the fact that it was already accomplished. Because God had a plan. And God had timing down. God was able to say not to worry, even if you don't see it. It's a done deal. And then 2,000 years later, Christ came. Long time to wait. And Christ came and was born, and as we sang, was laid in the manger. And his birth was announced to shepherds and kings, to magi. Christ came incarnate, God incarnate, and did for us what we could not do for ourselves, providing the perfect sacrifice ultimately for us. It's interesting to me, although I know the culture and, and, and why it occurred, but it was 30 years before Jesus started his ministry. 30 years to wait. He knew he was. We see that when he was 12 and he went into Jerusalem and he was talking to the men and uh, the rabbis in, in the temple and they were so amazed. You know, that's when his parents forgot him. When they left. Because they thought that he was with the cousins or something. 30 years. He waited. And then he shared the good news. And part of that good news was, after I die, I'll be raised again, and I'll come back. And you know what? He did. He was raised again, and he came back from there to talk to the disciples, to teach them, physically appearing and eating with them. And during that time of teaching, he said, I'm going to my Father who's in heaven so that the Spirit can come to you, but there will be a day when I come back as the King, the conquering King, 
Now that's the same promise that God made to Abraham. That one day your son will rule and everyone will be blessed through him. The promise didn't change in 2,000 years. And now it's been another 2,000 years that we've been waiting for Christ to come back as conquering king. A long time to wait. But we must have faith. The same kind of faith that Abraham had. Faith that we are justified by God's grace and the blood of Jesus Christ. Faith that we have been saved, that we are His children, that we're going to go to heaven. Faith that God will fulfill His promise. And one day, as our Advent reading noted in Revelation, there will be a new Jerusalem, a new creation. And it will be perfect. No need for the sun. The light of God will be shining everywhere. No more tears of sorrow, no sickness, no pain, no death. And we just need to keep moving forward like Abraham did. Abraham waited, but he didn't just sit back on his seat and say, Okay, God, whenever you're ready. No. He still moved forward, following God's call to the land that was there, claiming the land, interacting with the peoples that were there, saving his son, Lot, his uh, nephew Lot along the way, a few other things like that. All of which can be read about in Genesis. It's a wonderful story. Full of twists and turns. You should read it sometime. He kept moving forward even as he waited. And so must we. And if we do that, he was, as Paul notes, starting in verse 21, that he was able also to perform, and therefore it was also credited to, to him as righteousness. And it was not for his sake only that it was written, that it was credited to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited, to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he who was delivered over because of our wrongdoings, and was raised because of our justification. I had the reading from Acts, frankly, because of all those names. And it was not to give the literature just a hard time. But God promised that Abraham would be the father of many nations. And the Jews thought of themselves as a singular people. Paul's whole point through these chapters has been that it's not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. This is your promise. This is your hope. This is your foundation as well. The believers in Christ are the true children of Abraham, the true children of God. And that's something not just to be celebrated, but something to be lived out. Not just spoken of here in the church, but out in the world. We should be called Christians by our lives. That song that says they'll know we are Christians by our love and other things. Jesus said they'll know we're Christians by how well we follow his commandments.
Abraham's people were named Hebrews. The word Hebiru means wanderer. They were nomads. They kept their flocks. They were named for what they lived out. What about you? Particularly during this Christmas season, when whether they like it or not, the rest of the world's awareness of the promise has been raised. Deny it, though they may try with winter holidays and, and reminding us of all the other holidays that have been placed around this time. We still celebrate the birth of Jesus. And we still look to his coming again. And we should live that faith forward. And when we do, we'll be blessed, just like God promised. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you would turn with me to number 132, go tell it on the mountain. If you like listening to Christmas music during this time, and you happen to like that song, I have to tell you that the version that I heard by Pentatonix a few years back, and you can find it on YouTube, is one of the best versions of it I've ever heard. Um, a lot of fun. God has fulfilled His promise and is still fulfilling His promises even today. Blessing us, providing for us, giving us benefits. 
It's only fitting that we take some time and meditate both on those blessings and how we might share them with others as God has called us to do. So as Pamela plays the star in the east, meditate on what God has done for you and how you might give back. Join with me in the unison prayer of dedication. Gracious God, accept these gifts in grateful response for your generosity. May these gifts bring joy to those most in need of Christ's mission and ministry. Amen. just made my day. <laughs> On the back of your bulletin are a list of names, some situations as well. I ask you to pray for those people by name through the week. God knows their needs. Pray that God's will be done. And pray for the strength and patience of all those who are undergoing particularly long-term trials at this time. Let's come before God in prayer. God, our Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks and praise for you are an awesome God and you are an awesome Father. Lord, you can do so much more than we can imagine. And yet so often we just try to limit you to what we understand. Even though we trust in you, even though we believe in you, we still want to be in control. Lord, help us to let go. Help us to have faith. Help us to move forward on the basis of your directions, even when it doesn't make sense. 
much like Abraham did, in both his leaving his hometown, going to where you called him to be, and in his waiting for your son as his son, his descendant, his king. Lord, you give us so much that we don't even recognize, and the greatest of those gifts is love and forgiveness by your grace alone. Through Jesus, we are reconciled with you, and we can come before you celebrating that there is light. Celebrating that grandchildren are getting better. Celebrating that husbands and are getting better. Celebrating a community that comes together to welcome one of their own who is still undergoing a harsh trial. May we support them even as you have supported us by shedding your very blood for us and giving us your spirit. May we have that same kind of love. And we ask in that care for you to heal those that are sick and are hurt, whether it be spiritual, physical, or mental. Lord, make them whole to serve your purposes and to do your will. May people look at them and point to you. Lord, give us patience. It will be done in your time, not theirs or ours. Sometimes it can be hard to wait. Sometimes it can be hard to be at peace. Lord, we pray for families who have lost loved ones during this season, particularly the family that is in the bulletin. Lord, may they know that peace that passes all understanding and only comes from you. May they sense your presence upon them and remember your promise. The promise not just of a Savior, but of eternal life for those who believe, such that death is not the end, but merely a transition to a new life with you. And Jesus, Prince of Peace, come back soon. Bring your peace to the entire world as every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. Holy Spirit, be with each one of us. Give us wisdom. Give us courage. Give us perseverance so that we might be faithful witnesses to you, your love, and the mighty, wondrous things you have done. And Holy Spirit, be poured out on this church. Strengthen its ministries and its people. Keep it from evil. May it be a light in the darkness of this world, particularly during this time, but always. And may the folks who are here be beacons of joy and of hope that lead others to know you and of your love and your grace and your mercy. And Lord, may all that we do and all that we say as we live our lives for you be to your praise and your glory. For we ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
If you would remain standing as you're able and join me in singing number 77, Lift Up Your Heads, Ye Mighty Gates. <laughs> Come, I open wide. My heart to thee, here, Lord, abide. Let me thy inner presence feel. Thy grace and love in me reveal. May you go forth in from this place, recharged and renewed in your spirit, ready to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Showing the love of God and the good news of the gospel to everyone whom you meet. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. Amen.